Hey, Legacy Ministry College, Pastor Troy Bond here with Pastor Jerry Milliken. We're actually on the ground in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Gatlinburg, Pinton Ford, doing an outreach this weekend. And I've asked him to be our chapel speaker this week. Pastor Jerry, just kind of give a, just a brief biography of yourself. Uh, just how long have you been in the ministry? Because you, many of our students are actually in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You were actually in Chicago for a while. Just kind of give the mm -hmm. setup for the message that you're going to be sharing with us today. Well, uh, I lived in Chicago for eight years. We pioneered some churches there, uh, but our primary focus was to do street evangelism. Uh, we had teams that went out on the streets every week. And we also had summer interns that would come in uh, and do the work of ministry. And so I've always, uh, for many years, had a heart uh, to seek and save that which was lost. And so I'm excited about you guys and what you're doing uh, in this college and how that you're studying to show yourself approved unto God, uh, and it's a privilege to be able to do uh, chapel service. Perhaps I could even do more, and we're just excited about uh, what God is doing in your life as well. So uh, thank God for that. Amen. Pastor, sure we look forward to hearing from you today. Yeah, God bless amen. You. This year. is the centerpiece, that he needs to be the centerpiece. He should be the centerpiece. It, he should be the center of everything that we do. How many of y'all believe he should be the center of your thought life? He should be the center of your thought life. He should be the object of your affections. He should be the master in your homes. He, he's the center of everything. And uh, I took uh, that piece of bread and took a piece, a small piece of that bread and put it on the edge of the communion table. And I said, now as long as I'm the pastor, I'm going to make sure that Jesus gets this and that y'all get this. I pointed to the little crumb and I said, well, make sure that Jesus gets this and y'all get this. Well, let me tell you something. If you got any ounce of religiosity in your bones, that illustration will irritate you. It'll get you irritated. Why? Because you've been programmed thinking that this Jesus thing and this Christian thing is about you. When in fact, it's not about you at all. Matter of fact, I think John the Baptist said it well. I must decrease so that he might increase. Amen? And uh, so uh, I said, I don't know who this church belongs to. I've only been here a month. But I guarantee you the longer I'm here, the more I'm going to find out who it does belong to. And uh, I'm going to spend the rest of my time here giving Jesus back his church if it don't belong to it. It don't belong to a preacher. It don't belong to a deacon board. It don't belong to a denomination. It belongs to him. He's the one that paid for it and it belongs to him. How many of y'all believe it belongs to him? Yeah. I didn't realize the trouble I would have because shortly after that one of the board members come up and said well I don't really like the songs that we're singing and we need to go back to the hymns and blah 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 and the worship is far way too long now why is the worship so long and yeah, you know and, and I said well brother let me tell you something at the end of the day it really don't matter what you think because worship is not about you it's all about him Amen. and uh, we, we just need to get that do we not we need to get that we need to get that <laughs> hallelujah I want to share something with you and if you have your Bibles I'm, I'm going to read this kind of that you share this has been on my heart in Isaiah chapter 6 uh, Isaiah chapter 6 uh, you've read it many times we're just going to simply pull something from this text but Isaiah 6 uh, chapter 6 verse 1 said in the year that King Uzziah died I saw everybody say saw I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above uh, it stood the seraphim, but each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to uh, another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And verse 5 said, so I said, everybody say, said, said, 
I saw and I said, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes, look at there, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand, uh, uh, hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said... Behold, he, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And verse 8 said, and I heard, everybody say heard. heard. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I go and, he, and who will go for us? Then I said, there it is again, then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Now, I read these few verses to simply sum up the essence of our life. The essence of the Christian life is all about hearing something, seeing something, and doing something. All right. if, you want, if you want me to give you the simplified version of our Christian experience, it all boils down to seeing something, hearing something, and doing something. If you read this particular text in Isaiah, you'll see that this incredible experience that the prophet has was all about seeing something, hearing something, and doing something. He simply responded to what he heard and what he saw. Your whole Christian life should be all about that. It really should be. Matter of fact, when God created you, He created you in a marvelous way. He gave you uh, uh, five senses. He gave you these five senses to relate to the world, the natural world that you live in. But He didn't leave you just there. Not only did He give you uh, natural senses, He gave you spiritual senses. When you're born again, those spiritual senses uh, were placed in you. Matter of fact, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Anybody in here today ever tasted of the goodness of God? Woo! Taste and see that the Lord is good. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. So it's all about revelation. It's all about seeing the things of God and seeing the way God sees and hearing the things of God and hearing the way God hears and doing something about it. And it really is. Turn to Isaiah 59, if you will. I just wanted to pull that from the text because uh, that's what we see in Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14. Another passage that I'm sure is familiar to you folks. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. How many of you know that we have a shortage of justice in the land and righteousness in the land? And righteousness stands afar off for truth has fallen in the street. Now listen. There is a conspiracy that's being elevated right now in America. And it's just recently happened in a greater degree. And that is diversion and confusion. Diversion and confusion. There's so much going out, so much information. Now people don't know what to believe. I've had so many people say, I don't know what to believe about my government. I don't know what to believe about my city officials. I, I don't know what to believe about this virus and, and uh, whether it's man-made or, or what, blah, 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 blah. And so and all this information is flying through the air. And let me tell you, it's Satan's goal to try to muddy the water. It's Satan's goal to try to get people in a constant state of utter confusion. How many of you know that the devil is the author of all of that? Right. He's the author of all of that. And notice this. He said, truth has fallen in the street. And listen, friends, that's why your calling is so important. 
Because you are the one that declares the truth in the marketplace. You're the one that declares the truth of God. Listen, folks, the closer you get to God, the more truth you understand. The further away you get from God, the more lies and deception you tend to believe. That's why we need a revival. And I know that everybody has a definition of revival. But see, for to me, the bottom line of revival is the restoration of lost truth. So many Christians today has let truth slip away. And oh, how we need to draw close to God. Because when we draw close to God, the truths of God begin to be restored back to us. We need that. Truth has fallen. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Notice it. Then the Lord saw it. How many of you know that if he sees it, he expects you to see it? He said, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him. It broke his heart. He saw that he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought a, a salvation uh, to, before him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Let me tell you something, friend. Nothing get past, nothing gets past the eyes of God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And God is looking for a man. He's looking for a woman who will answer the call just as Isaiah answered the call. Here am I, send me. The problem today is that we're looking for somebody else to live out our Christian life instead of ourselves. Listen, friends, if you're waiting for somebody else to have a move of God so you can be a part of it, you may be waiting for an awful long time. What you and I need to do is we need to determine, I'm going to draw a circle and get right slap in the middle of that thing and say, God, start with me. If you don't do it in anybody's life, start with me. My whole Christian life, I'm not waiting for a preacher or a church or anybody, anybody else to set the, the spiritual temperature. I don't need somebody to set the spiritual temperature of my life. Whenever I go into a place, I set the temperature in the thing. I'm not waiting for somebody else. Friends, listen, life is all about hearing something, doing something, and seeing something. Today I want to talk to you about hearing something. It's so important that you get the spiritual earwax out of your ears. If you ever, if we ever need to hear the things of God, we need to hear God now. Faith comes by hearing. It didn't say faith come by reading. It said faith comes by hearing. What good does it do to read God's word if you don't hear what he's trying to say to you? Come on. Amen. Honey, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that read God's word and they're just as deceived as the day is long. <laughs> I mean, these are specialists, you know, lawyers for God. They got a pet peeve thing that live their whole life to try to prove. Listen, Chris, we got to get away from that. What we need to do is say, God, speak to me. Speak to me from the pages of your word. Listen, today, or this, this today, I want to share with you something about hearing the cries. God heard the cries, but today do you hear the cries? There's four cries I want to share with you today, if I may. May I do that, please? Yeah. The first cry that I want to share with you is the cry from above. The cry from above. If you go and you try to lead people to Jesus just for the sake of leading people to Jesus, then you miss the mark. This may shock some of you, but I, I've been leading people to Jesus for many years, but at the end of the day, I'm not doing it for them at all. If you're, if, if you're just trying to improve humanity or if you're trying to, oh, these poor sinners, they need God. Let me tell you, they don't deserve God at all. At the end of the day, you're not doing it for them. You're literally doing it for Him. 
And, and, and that should never change in your life. Whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. But friends, listen. One reason why you're motivated in ministry is you, you have heard the cry from the heart of God. Who today is walking near enough to the heart of God that they hear His cry? I don't know how you vision God. Maybe you think God is sitting on a lofty throne with not a care or concern in the world and He's happy all the time like Buddha. You know, the big Buddha guy. You know, just so happy. God is not that way. I want you to know that God is weeping. He hears the cries of the world and there is a cry from above. Jeremiah, you write this down. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 7 Jeremiah said, as a fountain cast out her wickedness, violence and spoil is heard in her. Notice what Jeremiah said. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Think about that. Jeremiah 6, 7 said, before me continually is grief and wounds. That wasn't just Jeremiah talking. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. But why in the world was this major prophet a weeping prophet? He wasn't weeping on his own. He was weeping because he put his finger on the very pulse of God. He understood the desperation that was in the heart of God. God longs for people to be saved. He desires for people to be saved. He desires for His creation to know Him. Yes. He said, before me continually is grief and wound. Listen, we got people lining up for the power of God, but yet they don't want to share the pain of God. It's one thing to operate in the power of God, but it's another thing to be broken over the thing that breaks His heart. So many believers today are following God from such a distance, they wouldn't know the heart of God if it knocked them on the ground. Listen, we need to know there is a cry. There is a cry that rips the very heaven and it's coming from our Father. Are y'all with me now? Isaiah 53 verse 3 says he is despised and rejected a man of sorrow and griefs. We see when Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane he cried and prayed so earnestly that his sweat become as great drops of blood. I don't know about you. But I've never wept so hard that my sweat becomes great drops of blood. I've never been in such agony of soul that I'm so grief stricken that my sweat becomes great drops of blood. But yet our Lord was a man of sorrow and a man of grief. Wonder how bad he's grieving over America today. When was the last time you have touched his heart and heard his cry over our land? When Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, one of the shortest verses in the Bible was Jesus what? But yet it's the most profound. We often glaze over it. We don't understand the incredible relationship that our Lord, Savior Jesus had with Lazarus. And everybody else thought that he was late, but he wasn't late. Lazarus was laying in the tomb, and the Bible says Jesus wept. It wasn't just a little casual sorrow. He just cried a little bit. No, matter of fact, it was so astounding and so deeply emotional that everybody around said, Oh, how he loved him. You remember reading that? Oh, how he loved him. His love for Lazarus was immense. His love for Lazarus, his love wasn't a seasonal love or a casual love or a convenient love. His love was astounding. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the cry from the heart of God. How many of y'all want to hear the cry from the love? I want to hear the cry from above. There's a cry in the heart of God today. Have you heard it? 
Then there's another cry, the cry from below. How many of y'all believe in hell? Amen. Yeah. Don't you wish that people would act like that? Right. I, I hear people say all the time, I believe in hell, Brother Jerry. And I go, do you really? Are you serious? I don't believe for one minute the majority of Christians really believe in hell. I don't believe it. Why? Because if you understood the love of God and if you understood eternal punishment, you could never, ever be a status quo Christian. It'll never happen in your life. It'll never happen. Turn to Revelation. I want to show you this. And I really, to be honest with you, I don't really want to read it. Revelation chapter 20. Probably one of the most saddest verses in the Bible. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 said, And I saw the great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to the words by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is not just ink on a page, friends. As I speak to you this very moment, every hour, 6,514 people go somewhere to meet their maker. Every time you inhale a breath in your body, seven people in this world die. And what are they doing? They're, they're swinging across a thread called time, ready to plunge into the eternal abyss. Brother Jerry, do you mean to tell me that there is a place, whether it's in the bowels of the earth or wherever it is, a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a place where the fire is not quenched and the worms dieth not? Are you telling me that's real? When was the last time, believer, your soul was gripped? With the moans from hell. God, it troubles me so bad. But does it trouble you? When was the last time you heard the moans and groans? How in the world can we live one moment of every day knowing the fact that there could be some of our loved ones that will go there forever? I don't know about you, but I've heard the cry from the heart of God. But I've also heard the cry from the regions of the damned. I also know, friends, it's real. You know, when I was a young boy, I got strung out on drugs. I've done a lot of acid. I hate to say that, but acid is a hallucinative drug. It keeps you awake. It's a wonder I just did not go crazy doing it. I remember coming off of an acid trip. I'd stayed up for days and I remember pulling myself up the stairway up into my room and I laid down in the bed and when I laid down in the bed, I fell in the bed in slow motion. And as soon as my head hit the pillow, a hand from heaven reached down and pulled me down to hell. And I was in hell. I later on wrote it into a poem. I think I've shared it with you. I don't know if I have. You ever heard it? I wrote it into a poem, my experience. Hopefully I can remember it. 
Hell is a mystifying thing. When people die, where do they go? Heaven or hell, nobody knows. Just think one minute that you were in hell. How would it really be? Would there be a devil or a lake of fire? Or could you really see? I could imagine just how hell could be because once upon a time I had a, a mystifying dream. It was a gigantic cave, enormously high. There was screaming and shouting. I, I knew I would die. There was a, a babbling lake that centered the cave. It was dark and hot. No one could be saved. My eyes were bloodshot as tears were running down. I cried, oh my God, as I kneeled toward the ground. I, I appeared in a rock and crawled vigorously behind. I felt a warm face, not eagerly defined. It was a middle-aged boy with a voice like me. I felt his face where I couldn't see. His figure was odd. It was that of mine. Then I jumped myself and woke up to find I was in hell for one minute. Hell is a mystifying thing. And when I woke up from that dream, vision, whatever you want to call it, I was completely paralyzed from my neck down. I could not move my body. All I could do was scream, Mother! Mother! Because I thought that I died and went to hell and my mother was gone and I was left behind. She come running up the stairs and said, Jerry, what is wrong? What is wrong? And finally, after a while, I got the feeling back in my body. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the cries. Because it's the cry from the throne of God and it's the cry from the bowels of hell that make eternity a reality. Friends, this is not reality. This is only temporary. That's why you have believers today that can't see past the nose on their face. 95% of all Christians in America are not kingdom minded at all. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the cries. Are y'all still with me now? There's another cry I want to share with you. It's the cry from without. There's a cry from above, a cry from below, but there's also a cry from without. Psalms 142, you can write this down. Psalms 142, verse 4 said, I looked on my right hand and behold, but there was no man. There was no man that would know me. Boy, that's, that's, that, that's really worth looking into. There was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Isaiah 58 talks about the chosen fast, but it's not a fast uh, where we push away food from the dinner plate. It's a fast of, of, of helping humanity and feeding those that are hungry and reaching those that are in bondage. He said, if you do this, if you, if you neglect this, you will hide your own flesh. The flesh of humanity. I don't know about you, but the average Christian goes through their life, living their own life, doing their own thing, and they don't even hear the cries. And some of these cries are, are incognito. Some of these cries, like you saw yesterday, were in the, the buckle of the Bible bell. And so everybody's a Christian. If your cousin was a Baptist preacher, that means you're saved. You know, I know God. And yet people are masters of deception. They seem to hide the cry in their own soul behind a religious smile. Yet there is a cry. There's not only a cry from the heart of God and the bowels of hell, but friend, there's a cry all around you. You don't have to go to New Orleans Bourbon Street to find lost people. All you got to do is step out your own front door. They're everywhere. They're all over the place. There is a cry, friends. Proverbs 21, 13 said, Whoever stops up his ears at the cry of the poor, he shall also cry himself, but will not be heard. I don't know, and I'm not quite sure, Pastor Troy, but there's an incredible benefit from Taco Tuesday. I don't know if you know this, but did you know that according to the scripture, your physical health is tied to feeding the poor. Amen. It's really amazing. I mean, there are so many benefits by just helping needy people. 
Say what you will about Mother Teresa, but there's a reason why she lived so long. Let me tell you something. We need to hear cries. Over the years, I've heard a lot of cries in my life. Over the years, I've accumulated many, 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 many stories that I pray I never forget. One of the stories was when I first got saved, I was living in Rome, Georgia, and I was driving my van in the pouring down rain out west Rome. And all of a sudden, I'm driving in the rain, and immediately the Holy Ghost stops me right in the middle of the road. And I look to my left, and there in a vacant lot in high weeds was a man sitting on an old tractor tire in the pouring down rain. I thought, now that's odd. And so I pulled in there, and when I pulled in there, I looked at him and he was just sitting there with his head or his face down in, in the pouring down rain. So I got out of the rain. It was a cold day, very cold day. And so I got out of my van and when he raised up, I went, in my mind, I went, oh God, he had a bad skin disease. I mean, it, 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 he really looked bad. His name was Carl. I later on got to know Carl. Carl was a homeless man in Rome, Georgia. Carl was a bum. Carl was a drunk. Carl couldn't read and write. And when Carl got drunk, he was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Matter of fact, he had burned a lot of bridges uh, behind him because his own children didn't want to have anything to do with him because alcohol was ripping them off. Carl was a homeless person. He lived behind Kmart back then, Kmart in a pine thicket. Later on, I went to go see Carl and saw that he had some pieces of plastic stretched out around these trees and that's where Carl lived. Carl drank every day. Carl would get up in the morning and go pick up as much aluminum cans as he could find just to buy him a cheap bottle of wine, perhaps maybe a hamburger. And wherever he passed out is where he passed out. One day I felt urgency in my heart and I went to the Bible bookstore, Rome Bible bookstore, and got Carl a little New Testament and had his name personally engraved on it. I knew Carl couldn't read and write, but I thought it would perhaps mean something to him. I looked everywhere in Rome and couldn't find him and finally I found him under a bridge. Got out of my van and went over to him and I said, Carl, I got something. I know you can't read and write, but we keep this near to your heart and reached down and just put it in his shirt pocket. Carl, I couldn't even get him to go eat with me because he said, you don't want to be seen with somebody that looks like me because his face was so horrible. I said, no, I, I, I don't mind, man. I, I want you, you know, to, to eat with me. Finally, Carl gets up from under the bridge and he looks at me and says, man, I don't know why you waste your time with somebody like me. He said, because all I am is a piece of trash. And he walks away. Man, when he said that to me, my heart broke in a million pieces. Went back to my bed and all I could do was cry. I said, why in the world would somebody view himself as a piece of trash? Several days later, I got up that morning and the newspaper was on my front porch. And I opened the newspaper and there on the front page, I saw that Carl had made the headlines. He always wanted to be important. And he was just an insignificant person that walked by all the churches in Rome, Georgia, and nobody would give him the time of day. I read the story, and as I read the story, I was crushed. What had happened was is Several days before that paper came out, Carl had gotten so drunk that he couldn't make it back to his little place behind Kmart, and so he went behind a Dollar General when it was cold and rainy, and he opened the dumpster, and he crawled inside the dumpster and passed out to sleep. None to knowing to him that early that morning, the garbage people would come, and they didn't know that a human being was in there. And they dumped the trash along with Carl in that garbage truck. And they crushed his body. And they found his remains in the city dump. 
All I am is a piece of trash. I don't know about you. When I hear the cries from the heart of God and the cries from the bowels of hell and the cries of those around me, I can't shut my ears to that, friends. I hope that you will spend the rest of your life hearing the cries of those around you. Years ago, we had an outrage and we don't do it anymore in the Indy 500. Anybody know where that is? Indy 500, for a long time, was one of the hardest outrages I've ever done in my life. It's way harder than Mardi Gras. I mean, it was just, it's hard. We would try to get people to come and they would go through so much physical abuse and we just couldn't get a team together. And I think one year we had 35 people and we thought that we were in hog heaven, man, with 35 people. One particular year, I'll never forget this, Benny, initially, and myself, we had a school that a church had bought. They turned it into, into a church. And also, we get a call. We get a call from the airport in Indianapolis, Indiana, from Steve. I never met Steve in my life, but Steve lived in Denver, Colorado, Pastor. He said, hey, he said, I'm here at the airport. He said, I heard that you guys were really needing street preachers. And he said, uh, I'm a street preacher. And he said, I have my associate with me. And I'm here to help y'all. I was, I was elated. I thought, wow, man, you know, I won't be the only one that gets beat up, you know. And uh, so I said, well, I said, Steve, I said, I'm going to send somebody to the airport to pick you up. I said, what do you look like? So I can tell my buddy he can identify you. I'll never forget what he said. He said, oh, Brother Jerry, he said, he won't have no problem identifying me. He said, I'm wearing a red cap that says Jesus is alive, and I'm in a wheelchair because I'm a quadriplegic, and I'm paralyzed from my neck down. I'm going, I, I, I think I heard wrong, and I go, uh, could you repeat that, please? He said, I'm wearing a red cap that said Jesus is alive and I'm in a wheelchair. I'm a quadriplegic and I'm paralyzed from my neck down. I said, uh, okay, Steve, hold on just a moment. So, and I look at Denny and I go, Denny, I said, I got this guy on the phone. He's at the airport at Indy, Indianapolis. He's a quadriplegic and he says he's a street preacher. And I said, you know, and, and Denny and I knew how hard, it, you know, the Indy was and and I'll never forget, then he looks at me and said, tell him to go back home. He said, we'll pay for his airfare if he'll go back home. Because we, we didn't want to be responsible for this guy. And all of a sudden, I get on the phone, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. And I said, uh, Steve, I said, uh, I need to let you know, we have had Christians down through the years brutally beaten. We've been, I mean, brutally beat. I mean, you know, we're talking busted eyes and blood running down from the eye. I mean, I tried to make it as graphic as I possible. My objective was to scare him off. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to be responsible for this guy. So I'm telling him, you know, and, and, and none of it worked. And I said, uh, Steve, I, said, I know you said you had somebody with you. I said, but we're going to be having very long days. we got a big parade we're going to lead out before the Indy 500. And I said, man, these racetrack people, I don't know what it is about them, but they are just bad. And I said, uh, I, said, I, don't, I, th I said, I think that will hinder you from preaching. And all of a sudden, he busts out laughing over the phone. And he said, Brother Jerry. I told you that I'm only paralyzed from my neck down. He said, I'm not paralyzed from my neck up. I can still preach. And I go, you know what? You want to die as a martyr? Go get that sucker, man. Go get him, man. We're going to see him die right here. I'll be honest with you. I had no idea what was in store. Why? Because the very next day was a huge parade downtown Indy. And he asked if he could lead it out. And what we would do is when the parade started, we would go before the parade and we would lead out the parade. We wouldn't even ask. We would just go. We were the leaders of the big huge parade. It's better to get forgiveness and permission. They were, we were on the street, man. They wouldn't go. And all of a sudden, Steve had this little mechanical thing they rigged up that held a microphone and he had a little piece of plywood over his little bony knees and he put a half mile hair on his knees and the guy pushed him, and Steve began to preach. 
And I'm telling you, I was walking beside him and the anointing of God was so thick on this man, I wanted to get saved all over again. Now listen to me. We only had about 15 people there. And, the, and, and most of the group that was with us, all they did was complain that the showers were too cold and that the floor was too hard and that the food wasn't that good. I mean, it just made me sick. And I thought, to, and I would look at Steve during our worship time and he would sit there and, and he would weep and cry and he couldn't even wipe the tears running down his face. His buddy would take a, a handkerchief and wipe his face off while he was adoring Jesus. I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Steve, could you and I have some time together per privately? He said, yeah. And I grabbed his, got his wheelchair and I pushed him in a Sunday school room and I shut the door behind me. And I said, Steve, I'm telling you something, buddy. You can't even brush your teeth. You can't comb your hair. You haven't walked in years. You live in Denver, Colorado, and you lead a street team that goes out on the streets every single week. Snow, rain, shine, and you're a quadriplegic. And you haven't complained not one single time. You preach for hours on the street. And I watch people come by and ridicule you and curse you. And not one single time have you complained about nothing. I said, I'm, I'll tell you something. I want what you, you got, buddy. And I had to take his bony hand and pick it up and plop it on top of my head. And I got down in front of that wheelchair and I said, man, I need you to pray for me. I said, because if God will help me, never will I complain anymore. Because if you can lead up a street team in Denver, Colorado, and be so persevering, my God. How many of y'all believe that Steve heard the cries? How many of y'all believe that? Steve made an impact in my life and I will never forget this man. Let's close with the last one. The cry from within. I believe that every believer that truly walks with God should have a cry in their soul. And if you don't have it, something's wrong with you. I know some Christians, their favorite song is I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall be. Yeah, you're right, because you ain't been moved in years. There's no water that's flowing through your soul. No wonder when you go pray, you pray a, a mechanical prayer out of your head while your spirit is unengaged. There is no river of living water flowing from your belly. May God help you. There is no cry. I don't know about you, but I won't be like the Apostle Paul when he stood up on Mars Hill and he seen the city totally given to idolatry. And the Bible says his spirit was stirred within him. Let me ask you something. And I know what the answer is. Are you part of the saved, sanctified, and satisfied crowd? I know you're not. Or you wouldn't be here. I don't know about you. There is a cry from my soul. There's a cry in my heart and the biggest cry that I have is to see the church return to her first love. I'm very, very passionate about that. It's the driving force behind my life. It's what I think about. It's what I dwell on. It's what I just can't get out of my heart. I believe that we have a huge majority of Christian people that no longer love God the way they used to. And it's that alone that keeps me up at night. I want you to know we need to cry. We need to cry in our heart. It was the same cry that compelled Jeremiah and Isaiah and John the Baptist. It was the same cry Perhaps when Paul was in a prison and he felt, he felt like that he needed to pen his final letter to his son, spiritual son, Timothy. He said, give me something to write on. Timothy, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. 
Henceforth there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me and all those who love his appearing. We, we don't really know this, but we're told by history that the apostle Paul died at the hands of King Nero, perhaps on King Nero's chop block. There's no doubt that the apostle Paul went to his death as he laid his head down on that chop block and looked at King Nero and said, cut it off. Instant death, instant glory. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the cries. The cry from the heart of God, the cries of the bowels of hell, the cry from those that are needy without Jesus around me, and the cry in my own soul. I want to ask you something. How many of you this morning, you can just play something. How many of you this morning will say, Brother Jerry, I will never forget this message. I hope you don't. I hope that this message is branded on your soul so that you'll never forget it in your life. I want to spend my life hearing something, seeing something, and doing something. There was a nurse who was so vocal with her faith and finally the doctor she worked with pulled her aside and said, Honey, you openly talk about your faith. But I have to ask you privately, do you really believe this? Do you believe there's a heaven? Do you believe there's a hell? Do you, do you believe there was a man called Jesus and he died for your sins and mine? Do you really believe that? She looked at that doctor and she said, Yes, doctor, with every ounce of my being. And he said, Well, I got news for you. If you really believe that, you can't live the way the rest of us live. You can't. And I would step out on the limb and say, no, you can't live the way the rest of the church is living. There's got to be a change. I want you to come and pray today. And this is what I want you to pray, God. Let me hear the cries. Let me spend my life hearing something, seeing something and doing something all the days of my life. I want you to come pray. Would you do that? Let's pray.